Would you like me to seduce you? That's it, man. It's game over, man. It's game over. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, he walks in a mind. Why is the rum always? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. It's a trap! Everything has an elm strings. Hey guys, welcome to the Celluloid Fiends Podcast. I'm your host, Mo Long, and you can follow me at Mitchell C. Long on Twitter. You can read my writing on film and oh so much more at cupofmo.com. And we really appreciate you listening. We would also appreciate if you went over to the iTunes store and left us a rating and left us a review and also subscribed on your favorite podcast app. And as always, I am joined by my awesome co host Hey, I'm Gabriel Orto. Welcome to Celluloid Fiends. If you want to go ahead and give us a like on Facebook, that would be fantastic. Tonight, we are talking about The Black Cauldron. This is a Walt Disney feature animation film that came out in 1985. And it was the 25th Disney animated feature film made. And it was the first animated feature film from Disney to be graced with a PG rating. The Black Cauldron had a budget of $44 million, but it only grossed $21.3 million at the box office. Hence why there's no ride at Disney World. <laughs> I don't even know what that ride would look like. A big set of boobies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that could actually work. <laughs> and I feel like that would attract a, a pretty large audience. <laughs> People would turn to me, jump the line for that one. Uh, it's loosely based on the first two books in the Chronicles of Prudane series by Lloyd Alexander. And it was directed by Richard Rich and Ted Berman, who also directed the 1981 film The Fox and the Hound. So this movie is set in the land of Prydain in the Middle Ages and follows a young boy, Taryn, who is an assistant pig keeper. And the pig happens to have magical powers, because naturally. And he ends up being captured by the Horned King, who is voiced by John Hurt. And along the way, trying to protect the pig, Hin Wen, from getting captured by the Horned King... He meets Princess Eleanor, Gurgi, who... How would you describe Gurgi, Gabe? <laughs> <laughs> As a fantasy upright walking dog. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty apt description. And he can talk, also. Uh, and really likes to eat apples. Yeah. Uh, and flute or flam. So this was a Mopic, and I ended up choosing this movie because when I was a kid, my family had all these Disney books. Among them, there was a book of The Black Cauldron, but I never actually saw the movie when I was a kid. Still, that was one of my favorite books, and I'd always get my mom to read it to me. And it wasn't until much later in life, I was in my mid-twenties, that I actually was able to watch the movie, and it just really struck me as very different from a lot of the other Disney movies that I've seen. It's very dark in tone. Especially the Horn King. Like, he is something you don't see a lot in Disney movies these days. There was even, like, some sexual jokes. And I'm really surprised Disney put this out. <laughs> like, this is not leaving the Disney vault anytime soon. They're, like, I can't predict a Blu-ray release of this. Surprisingly, it did have... It got a VHS release, and it did get a DVD release. And I think the music from it was released as a 25th anniversary edition, or something like that. But you're, you're very correct. I think this one is going to be, for the most part, locked away in the Disney vault for a while. So what, what were your first impressions upon seeing this? I had heard of The Black Cauldron before. I had never seen The Black Cauldron. Um, I thought it was a very well put together animated movie. 
if someone would have told me that it was made by Disney, I would have flipped my lid. But it was so it was very good fantasy story. I just don't think that it's necessarily for the young young children. No, it's certainly not a film that is safe per se for young children it's not alone in that it has dark elements in the disney canon like even when you look at other disney animated films like bambi the mom gets shot at the beginning right and uh like the the witch in snow white scared the shit out of me when i was a kid i was terrified in that theater when i saw it for the first time and, but this, it's just more prominent, and it's throughout much of the film as opposed to right. one it's not, scene. It's not like you, it, the scary part comes and then it's gone. It's the entire movie. There is darkness on the land, and it is just... It's a really good movie. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's, what, that's one of the reasons that this movie is... Maybe my favorite Disney movie and Disney animated film of all time, partially because it, it is dark. Uh, it's very well made technically, and it's it's a well done fantasy film. The, the quest is really engaging, and it gets going pretty quickly and just holds your attention throughout the whole film. Like I can't think of a lull point. No, that I experienced. There is none. And it's it's a cast of characters that's kind of ragtag, so it doesn't really offer too many surprises, except when Gurgi jumps into the cauldron. Right. And I, I thought he was actually dead. Exactly. Like, but you know, it being a Disney movie, they can't really have a character like that just die. Usually when someone dies in a Disney movie, they're like an older mentor type character. The parent. Or some someone like that. It's never like the friend or someone of the main characters. So I was really surprised. So the fact that they brought Gurgi back it did not surprise me. No, that totally makes sense. Uh, for whatever reason, it's never the friends. It's always like the parents or, or a villain. Mm-hmm. Villains are totally fair game. Oh, yes. And another aspect I really liked, uh, like I mentioned, the technical aspects, the colors are beautiful. Oh, yes. Like these fluorescent greens. But again, a lot of that's kind of that terrifying imagery. Like, the cauldron born, it's this army of undead skeletons. So who the fuck thought this would be for a kid's movie? Granted, it did have a PG rating, but that... I, that Usually, like, PG these days... One. PG these days is, like, frozen. <laughs> you know, it's... It's, it's P, like, PG... The, like... The rating system back when the Black Cauldron came out was very, very loose. Very loose. I remember watching... I forgot the name of the movie, but I was like... Eight or nine years old. And I, I picked up a PG movie from Blockbuster. And I watched the movie. And there was a whole scene where women just took their tops off. <laughs> I'm like, this is a PG movie. It was a different time. And that gets back to what you were saying about how there's some... Uh, sexual imagery in here when, when you made the when Gabe made the joke about <laughs> the giant pair of boobs as the black cauldron ride <laughs> there's one scene where a uh, fluter is turned into a frog by <laughs> one of these witches and he ends up between her breasts and this is a kids movie right or at least in theory it's a kids movie I'm curious, though, why it had such a low box office performance. I don't think it was promoted that well. And it was, and it didn't seem, it, it didn't, I don't think it had the entice of, like, a Snow White or a Beauty and the Beast 
or Cinderella. And a lot of these movies in, involve Disney princesses. and But there are some Disney movies out there that kind of swing away from that formula. And another area that the black culture differs from the Disney formula, I don't think it's unique in this, but it doesn't have any singing in it. No, it does not. And that was another thing that, that really shocked me when I was first watching this. Because I kept expecting there to be some sort of musical numbers to try to maybe add a little bit of levity and detract from some of the darker themes, and there weren't. There, there was some goofy humor in there, naturally. Well, well like with a character like Gurgi, <laughs> it's hard to stay away from the slapsticks sometimes. But I think they did a pretty good job of balancing it. What do you think of Gurgi's character? Typical, almost. Typical dumb friend, typical creature who just likes food. <laughs> it was very typical. It fit well in the story, don't take it the wrong way. It fit very well. But it was very it was just typical. I absolutely agree with you. It was very typical. It, and a little cliche, but it didn't bother me the way oh, no. like Jar Jar Binks did, for right. example. So yeah, it wasn't really anything new. But th- a lot of the other aspects to this film kind of compensate for the Gurgis in the story. Right, exactly. Like and the witches yeah. and the fluter flams. And and the Horn King. Oh, yes, definitely. As a villain, he might be my favorite Disney villain. And... It's very it's phenomenal character design. And John Hurt did the voice of the Horn King. And there's this cool making a video where he's showing how he was able to do, produce that vocal sound and he's kinda of like pinching his throat and making this rasping noise. It's a cool little featurette. And it's just interesting how he was in a it didn't seem like there were a ton of other highly known actors in the film. There wasn't. Weirdly not I know of. No. I didn't recognize almost any other names in there. Weirdly, it seemed to get a pretty good critical reception. And Ebert gave it a a three and a half out of four. And really praised this. So, especially considering the critical reception that it had from legitimate critics like Ebert do you, you think get, it would have performed you a got, you got to look at the critical the critical response critics are mostly adults people who are our age or older and they don't mind a story like this they're intrigued they liked Lord, they like they read Lord of the Rings cuz the movies were out then but they did have the animated Lord of the Rings I think <laughs> Um, but they like stuff like this, and but like this movie doesn't scream, take your kids. No, you know, and that's probably where the low box office comes into play. And unfortunately, there's often a perception from adults that because something is animated, it's For not kids. exactly. Uh, inter- interestingly, on our Holy Bible of Rotten Tomatoes, it has a, a critic score of 57% and an audience score of 48 That's surprisingly low. On, on both accounts. I figured there would be a discrepancy, and I assumed critics might have a much higher score than the audience. 57 seems super low. So... What are some of your favorite animated films? Um, Watership Down. Haven't seen it. Um, the South Park movie. <laughs> well, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like a lot of the the Ghibli stuff. Um, My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service. Um, Akira. Oh, I fucking love Akira. Um, Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell's great. 
Not the live action one, though. Oh, of course. <laughs> that was impressively bad. I didn't want to desecrate my eyes going to see that movie. I wanted to go watch it so that I could write a review of it and voice my opinion and kind of compare it to some of the past Ghost in the Shell movies. Mm hmm. Because the most famous is, of course, the first in the series, but. There were a couple TV shows and a couple subsequent movies, one of which was called something like Ghost in the Shell, the new movie, and that was actually pretty good. It had a lot of that geopolitical banter and showed how the characters had advanced since the first movie. Hmm. And it, it seemed like a number of the ones that you named were kind of more adult-oriented. It's like some of the Ghibli stuff can be more kid-oriented, Except for if you get into, like, Princess Mononoke and The Red Turtle and stuff. There, there, are, there are a couple Ghibli movies that I wouldn't recommend for kids. The only one that I've actually seen was Spirited Away. Mm-hmm. And I fucking hated it. The little girl... I watched a dubbed version, and the little girl is just so whiny that I just was turned off by the film and in fact didn't like the protagonist. I've heard that the sub is a little bit better because you don't have the voice acting from the dub. Um, I'll say this about Ghibli movies. They're usually pretty good dubbed or subbed but they have a tendency to get like loud American girls to to do the dubs for the Ameri for the English versions. And if you didn't like the dubbed version, maybe the subs may work a little better for you. But I I think those like but then most of the Ghibli movies, man, are like it's more about like fun and whimsy and magical. You gotta look at the scenarios going on. It's very interesting, some of these movies. And a lot of it involves little kids, too. Which can, for an adult to hear screaming kids for an hour and a half can be a little annoying. So you just kind of... Sometimes you just gotta get over the fact that this movie's about kids. That's fair. So Maybe I'll give a few of those another shot. But that one experience with Spirited Away just kind of turned me off from... The Ghibli scene. Yeah, I do. I do like a lot of animated films and shows. The Black Cauldron, of course. I mean, hence I picked it for this episode. And Ghost in the Shell, like you said, I uh, love the first. Ghost in the, the Shell. shows, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. You know, which was I like Tokyo Ghoul. Um, That's good. Berserk. Ajin, like. Uh, there's some there's some good animated work out there. Even the 2012 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle series. Oh, that no, no offense to any other version of the Ninja Turtles. I think besides the original animated series that they had, that's one of the best versions of the Ninja Turtles out there. It got really deep in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. It got it like they didn't they didn't play the audience for a fool. No, like the, which was. Part of the issue sometimes with some of the other ones, like they were just about pizza and stuff like that. That the, but they got really into turtles lore. They did, and Splinter actually dies. Yeah, in the series. Exactly, and I'm a little upset that they ended it and. They're starting a new one where it kind of looks like they're going towards the kid angle a little more. That's totally what they're doing. The other interesting part about the 2012 series was the way that it had so many pop culture references in there that were geared towards people who grew up in the 80s. Right. Or the 90s. Like, there was one episode that was based off of Big Trouble in Little China... And there was one entire season that was very inspired by horror movies. And they even had a Halloween 3 reference. Which, as horror movies go, that's one of the more 
fringe. Obscure ones. Yeah. So I, I mean, I know there is has been show. even some Gremlins references in that show. I know there's been Friday Thirteenth references in that show. It's ve- it's it's I think it's just it's 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 smarter than its age in my per- like you're like oh it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is for kids, <laughs> but it it really. Like, if you really watch it, like you sit down and watch the series, it's really intelligent. It is. And as much as I hate to say this, because I grew up on the 80s and 90s Ninja Turtle series, it's more intelligent than that. Oh, yeah, That's definitely. still fun to watch. That, that's the, but that's like the... But here's the thing with the Ninja Turtles. It's either you go all the kiddie way, or you go all the adult way. Because those are the two best. And those are two polar opposites. The one in the eighties and nineties, it went completely the kid way. The one, the most recent one, it went completely the adult way. And a lot of the time, with there was other ones that they tried to like go with the middle ground or something like that, and it just didn't work out. They had like the live action series. Oh, that was like the next mutation or yeah, something. Yeah, Ninja Turtles: The Next Mutation. They had so another. Bad. They added a female turtle in there. <laughs> I I did like that. That was a nice touch, but that show was just shit. They made um they made a special guest appearance on Power Rangers during that <laughs> during that show. Oh, I think I missed that. I'm kind of <laughs> glad I missed that. Oh no. But and the movies with the suits I liked though. Oh, yes. Secret of the Ooze. Mm-hmm. Straight up classic right there. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to keep talking about the Black Cauldron. Legend has it, there was once a king so cruel and so evil that the gods feared him. Since no prison could hold him, he was trapped forever in the form of a great black cauldron. The old king, that black-hearted devil. Walt Disney Pictures presents The Black Cauldron. Escape into a world of darkness. Are you coming? Me? Go in there? Oh, no, no, no. It's a terrible place. A world of excitement. <sighs> a world of dreams. Aaron, the greatest warrior, a true hero. And through the magic of 70 millimeter photography and six track Dolby sound, you will be transported to a fantasy event for the entire family. Hey guys, we're back and we are talking about The Black Cauldron. So, were there any films that you saw when you were a kid that really frightened you? Which is. I'm not familiar with that. It was a kind of a children's movie, but there are scenes in that movie that are just horrific. Okay. Uh, one that had witches in it that scared me uh, <laughs> was Hocus Pocus. I was, like, pretty little when that I saw it. That scared you? I was pretty little. I was, like, maybe, I don't know. Everybody saw... Three, five. I was pretty small. Like... I'm gonna give a very popular un- opinion here. I am not the biggest fan of Hocus Pocus. Weirdly, it has this dedicated cult following. I thought I think it's a good movie. If it's on, I would totally watch it. But I'm not obsessed with it like some people are. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about that movie that has garnered such attention. I will say this about Hocus Pocus. It is the best Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker has ever looked in her life. <laughs> that movie. <laughs> that is one compliment I will give Hocus Pocus. All I can think of is how they were making fun of her in that one South Park episode. Yes. I can't remember which episode it was, but I just remember they had Sarah Jessica Parker. And 
But you want to know the weird thing? Out of all the witches in that movie, I forgot the actress who played, like, the more bigger witch, but she's the best looking out of all of them these days. Wait, the Bette Midler one? No, or, not or... that. The other one. Oh, it was like Kathy Najimy or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that movie, I was I was pretty young. That movie scared me a little bit. Return to Oz scared the living fuck out of me when I saw that. That scared the fuck out of a generation. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, most of the movie is a little weird. It opens with... Dorothy getting fucking electroshock therapy. Yeah. And there are literally the people under the stairs. That part, I was like, this is a little weird, but I think some of that went over my head when I was a kid and saw it. The part that got me was the heads. It, when they, in, yeah. in the cases, and they all start screaming, and I did not like that as a kid. The, the movie is genuinely terrifying. And the thing <laughs> is, is that. I don't think they aimed for it to be that terrifying. It just kind of happened. Yeah, it just debuted and was terrifying. But how did that even make it out of the drawing room before someone realizing, you know what, this is not a kid's movie? It does, supposedly, I haven't read any of the books, but follow the books more closely because they were kind of dark. It's just a weird movie in general because it also doesn't seem at all like a sequel to the first film, which it's clearly supposed to be. Right. Drastically different tones. Oh, yes, definitely. You want another movie that kind of frightened me as a kid? More specifically, there is one scene that is really terrifying in this movie. Was the never-ending story. That's one I've never seen. You've never seen the never-ending story, Mo? Nope. Mo, you gotta get on that. Okay. I'll, I'll add that to my watch list. Yes, please do. I have heard similar sentiments, though, from friends who have seen it. And they mentioned that it had some kind of terrifying moments in it. Yeah, there, there's a scene where there's a horse drowning, and it's very... It's not very settling, especially for children. Oh, that's ballsy of a kid's movie to kill off an animal like that. Because it's not animated, is it? It has puppets. No, maybe or this something? is not animated. Oh, that's that's strange. Because in an animated movie, you can kind of gloss over things, and it sometimes takes the reality out of it a bit. So you can have a horse die and. It's slightly less frightening than a live and it's action. It's a really movie. drawn out scene, and like there's a kid like trying to save the horse, like a train. No, no, like it's just, it's terrifying. Oh, that's super depressing. <laughs> the the interesting part about the black cauldron, right, is that it's. They're darker, and we think of that as unusual. But that's mostly because it was one of the first dark animated films that Disney made. But right. if you recall, they dabbled quite a bit in live action films. And some of those are kind of dark, like uh, Black Hole, I believe, 1979 film, was the first. PG rated live action film that Disney made and that one has some scary moments I, I, that's one though that I don't think was intended for kids necessarily and let me state a fact I love Disney I mean I, lo I love their movies but people forget sometimes that Disney owns subsidiary film making companies and let me just make one example Disney owned Miramax <laughs> Miramax made natural born killers. <laughs> NBK. That is a great movie right there. <laughs> Still having the Disney name splashed across it. Right. Is a is is a bit different than using a different company name. Exactly. When it has the Walt Disney logo on it and it's still frightening, it says something. 
Because Disney also owns like Star Wars properties now and Marvel. and Marvel, and those don't have a Disney splash screen beforehand. Right, they have, like the Marvel logo beforehand or Lucasfilm. So yeah, it's it's definitely like the Disney name plastered across it. And well, Disney also made a bunch of these live action movies like Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. And Davy Crockett, which I'm not sure what the demographic was. I think they were made to appeal to younger audiences, but also somewhat older audiences. And those totally had that like sense of adventure in them that I think is captured quite well in the Black Culture. Just it has fantasy elements as opposed to kind of some of the more sci-fi elements that you see in Black Hole or kind of the Frontiersman setting from Davy Crockett. Disney Disney is a very weird company because there are even movies that Disney made under the Disney moniker that they don't want people to remember. Like Song of the South. Oh. Yeah. That was that, that was a rough movie. It's hard to believe that a company so well known for its seemingly innocent kids movies made Song of the South. Well, I'll also say this, and once again, not really pissing on the Disney legacy. Walt Disney, even though he made some of the greatest children's movies of all times and made our dreams come true, was a pretty well-known anti-Semite. Yeah. And and racist. So you just gotta try to separate yourself, like, the person You gotta gotta try to separate Walt Disney from his works. (laughs) Because it'll ruin it for you. Yeah. Uh, So do you have a least favorite Disney film. A least favorite Disney film? Yeah. We'll, mm. we'll, we'll exclude like Song of the South. Okay. And and just concentrate on kind of maybe it's more of the well known. More of the more well known Disney movies. I would have to say this is a tough one because a lot of them are really, really, really good. Um the Mighty Ducks 3. <laughs> I never even saw the third one. Well, like, it takes place after they win, like, the Junior Goodwill Games gold medals. And they all go to this, they all get scholarships to this private high school. And they, and they have to, like, they get, like, scholarships to play on the JV team. And after beating Iceland in a national competition, they are struggling to beat the varsity team of this high school. And it's just, it blows my mind. How did this get made? I don't know. Like, Emilio Estevez is barely (laughs) in it. Like, some of the main cast members drop off. Um... Like, the guy who owns the hockey shop in Minnesota that there is like their old mentor, he dies in the movie. And it's just... it like And here's the thing. I loved Mighty Ducks 1 and 2. So who but, doesn't love Mighty Ducks 1 and 2? You know what? I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to meet them. So when this movie came out, I was like super pumped to see it. And it did not deliver at all that is unfortunate what a way to see a franchise go down I know Uh, looks like they really pucked up that one yeah they did so I think my least favorite Disney film would be Tarzan there was just there was a little too much Phil Collins in it yeah a little too much Phil Collins yeah and I just I, I couldn't get down with it the Second least favorite, Frozen. I guess that's technically Pixar, but we'll we'll count it. 
Is Pixar is Frozen a Pixar or a Disney picture? Uh, you know, I don't know, but Disney was involved in some way. It was, it was a Disney film. Yes. Oh shit. Okay. That is a Disney movie. Right. All right then. Frozen. I thought it was just so overrated. It was a pretty cliche story. The music wasn't actually that good. I just think that it was. Like, it was. It'd been a long time since they had done. Not really a long time, but it'd been a little bit since they had done, like, one of those princess type movies. Well, The Princess and the Frog came out in. I don't know. 2010, perhaps? I. Honestly, I did not know about that movie until. I made friends that had kids living down here in North Carolina. Uh, it came out in 2009. That was one I actually went to see in the theaters when it came out because it was a return to that hand-drawn animation style, which I was pretty jazzed about. And the other part of it was that it was set in New Orleans, and I love New Orleans. And I think that's m- maybe Disney's most underrated animated film next to like the Black Cauldron I don't know why it didn't take off more and why something like Frozen got so popular I don't know I, I've seen that movie and I think it's better than Frozen I also think that Tangled is underrated oh Tangled was great I loved that um and I would also like to say that if you buy a Studio Ghibli movie here in the United States of America, that Ghibli is one of the few companies that Disney has bought the animation and put it out with the Disney logo on it. Wait, why? Because Ghibli movies are so fantastic and whimsical, they said, we got to release this in America under Disney. Oh, that's weird. But I guess it's kind of the same way that Netflix will syndicate some things that aren't actually Netflix originals and then just slap the Netflix logo in front of it. Like, they did that with um, with um, My Neighbor Totoro. They did it with Kiki's Delivery Service. They did it with Princess Mononoke. They did it with... I think they did it with Spirited Away. I had no idea that Disney was doing that. Trying to see the the movies were so there. good. They're like, oh, we want to do the American releases for these movies. And I even remember my neighbor Totoro. Like they got like Dakota Fanning to do one of the voices. Wait, what? Yeah. Really? The little girl who was in all those horror movies when she was a kid. Yeah, how long? She was in like, what was she? In? She was in War of the Worlds. She was also in Twilight. Let's not give Dakota Fanning too much credit on this show. Oh, she was in Twilight? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I saw that. So, yeah, I didn't realize she was in Twilight. Yeah. I th- For whatever reason, I thought she was in some horror movies back in the day, but I could be wrong. She was apparently in Charlotte's Web and Hide oh, and Seek. Yeah, she was. Oh, and Kim Possible, A Stitch in Time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and you are correct. She did uh, do some voice acting in My Neighbor Totoro. So, I would love to see The Black Cauldron get a Blu-ray re-release. It probably won't. Do you think if it were released now that it would be more popular and fare better than its initial 1985 release? If it was marketed the right way. First thing I would do is I would take away I would take away the Disney logo and then I'd market it towards mm-hmm. people our age or people like age 13 to 35. Those are like the group of people I would market it towards. Kind of like the demographic that a lot of Funimation anime has right and or maybe a lot of the demographic of like lord of the rings right because a 
similar film series and TV series, which I mentioned earlier, Berserk, that kind of had a, a more mature but similar vibe to The Black Cauldron. So, yeah, I think given the proper marketing and targeting the right age group, I think if this were released now... you got to know, totally you gotta know your demographic when it comes to these type of things. I put it out under one of their other monikers, one of the other well, one of their other companies. I wonder if Lucasfilm would let them release it with that name. Uh, Miramax. No, yeah, Miramax. <laughs> yeah, and um, it seems like a strange choice, though, that the two directors who also directed The Fox and the Hound were brought on board for this project which I think clearly just goes to show that Disney had their head up their ass when they were trying to figure out who this was marketed to exactly and if this were remade would you keep it relatively the same or do you think you would change it and make it more mature if we're marketing it more towards an adult like a teenager to adult audience I may try to make it a bit more mature, but other than that, it's a pretty good movie. There's not a lot I would change about this film. Nor would I. If you were casting it today, who would you get for the Horn King's voice? <sighs> mm. Patrick Stewart. That would be a good choice. That would be a great choice. I was going to say Andy Serkis. I think he would do a good job as well. But I feel like that was kind of a more obvious answer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like the, uh, I like the Patrick Stewart or Lance Heinrichson. I don't know if he's done any voice acting, but I could see him doing a good job with, with that voice. Maybe, um... Benedict Cumberbatch. Because he did a really phenomenal job as Smog right. in the Hobbit trilogy. Yeah, I think he could he could do a really good job. Of course, if it were made now, there's so many more vocal effects that could be used exactly. to supplement. And part of the beauty of this is that it was just like a microphone and then John Hurt. It, it was basically up to the person speaking to make up the voice. There wasn't a lot of things you could do with the voice. No. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but Marlon Brando, when he did um, The Godfather... Yeah. To make his voice and his sound like that, he used to stick a ton of cotton balls in his mouth. I did hear that one. Oh, you know, you know who else I think would be good as the Horn King? Oh. Doug Bradley. Yes. That would be fucking great. Because he had a good pinhead voice. Yes. And I feel like that could translate well to the Horn King. Uh, give, give the Horn King a few soliloquies and you're good to go. All right, so let's rate this. All right. The Black Cauldron, the Walt Disney Classic... Your buddy Gabriel Orto gives that 4.5 stars. That's a pretty high rating. Why 4.5? Honestly, I couldn't pick apart this movie that much. Like, it's a, it's a pretty well-rounded animated movie, and I really love hand-drawn animation because it's something I don't see that much anymore. A lot of people are going the more computer-generated gen computer generated route, and... I love watching a good old-fashioned hand-drawn movie, and I thought it had a good story and good characters, and there was very little I would change about it. So 4.5, I think, is a reasonable rating for this movie. Absolutely. Uh, I was actually going to go 4.5 as well. Oh! Because there's just not much that you can criticize. Like you said, the animation is just gorgeous, I loved the color palette a lot. It had 
kind of a lot of these technicolor greens and purples and reds, which really popped off the screen. Elmer Bernstein did the soundtrack and did a phenomenal job with that. It's kind of understated, but it helps set the atmosphere a bit. There are likable characters, and right from the get-go, you're really just sucked into this story until the end. And it just feels very unique, even with everything that Disney and even non-Disney studios have produced since then. So it's, it's hard to really pick apart this movie. It is. It's enjoyable. So that's our episode for tonight. Yes. Uh, we really appreciate you listening. It, head over to the iTunes store if you haven't already done so. Subscribe. Uh, leave us a rating. Um, if you want to, go ahead and click a like on our Facebook page. And we'll see you next time. Please, for God's sake, please stop it. There's no more time. You've got to... Please, stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Stop it.